Update. Does a child who didn't see one parent because the other parents told them despite custody orders in place have to repay the time debt after age 18? Original post. Posting anonymously because I think I know the answer, but feel like an idiot asking anyway. I hope I describe this clearly. My parents split when I was very young and had shared custody about 50-50 at a time. My mother ran off with me to Canada not long after, but cancer took her when I was 15. I was taken back to my father and is always told that because I was away from him for 8 years but he had 50-50 custody that I had to repay that time debt for 4 years after I turned 18. I took it as just how things are. There was a letter from my dad's lawyer that I haven't been able to find that I had when I came back to him pointing out that I would be a minor until after I turned 22 and a few months. I am not allowed to leave home much except to work. Dad gets all of my money to support me. I am not allowed to see guys. And I am not allowed a car. And it seems really unfair to me and nobody else my age is in this situation. Does any of this seem legally real? The more people I talk to, the more it seems my dad has me under a big con. But I'd like to know for sure. I know it might be trying to prove a negative, but is there a link to a law I could use to show for sure either way? Now for the top advice before reading the updates. I'm not surprised your mother ran. Your father is nuts. No, none of this is a thing. At 18, you are legally an adult and can move out, and I would strongly suggest you do so. Your dad is lying to you. Secure copies of all your vital documents and open your own bank account as soon as you can. You are legally an adult, and you do not have to live like this. In ranked order of most to least important, birth certificate, passport, driver's license, social security card. With a birth certificate and passport, everything else is replaced easily with a short trip to the local DMV or social security office. The birth certificate is like a root document that makes other documents much easier to get. In addition to what everyone else has said, remember that a custody agreement is between your mom and your dad. Your mom had an obligation to fulfill that agreement by sending you to visit your dad. You were never legally under any obligation to fulfill the custody agreement. You do not owe your parents anything. There are actually laws against the idea that children owe their parents anything for existing and being raised by them. Or some parents otherwise would try to sue their children for the thousands of dollars we spent on your food and clothes and room and board between ages 0 to 18. If your mom failed to fulfill the custody agreement, you were never under any obligation to rectify that. For example, the courts would not expect a 10-year-old to purchase their own plane ticket to visit dad when mom failed to do so. The custody agreement is not meant to bind you to your parents. It is meant to bind your parents to an agreement so that one of them doesn't prevent the other from seeing the kids. Others have already given you plenty of advice regarding getting out of your current situation, resources to help you if you're in danger, etc. It is perfectly legal for you to walk out the door this minute and just keep on walking. If you are not in immediate danger though, I suggest that you plan your exit carefully and get your resources ready ahead of time. Your father sounds like he has no respect for your rights or privacy, so it would follow that he might monitor your phone and computer use, search your room, look in your purse, diary, whatever. Please be very careful to keep your preparations a secret from him, because such a controlling man would be much easier to get away from if you were taken by surprise. Best of luck! Do the hard things because they're worthwhile in the end. Thank you so much. That's what I was hoping for. Just a word can be a key to more information. I know dad looks through my stuff, but he's a technological vacuum. That's something at least. Now for the update. I'm safe and I'm out. I organized a place to stay with a coworker. I have new bank accounts and all my paperwork. My dad has some regular support meetings on Saturdays that go on for hours. So I prepared everything the week before, found where my paperwork was, and walked out. I've been approved for a rental and I moved there soon. I contacted two police stations near us beforehand, who both understood Dad's nature straight away, when I told them he'd been telling me I couldn't move out because of the time debt, and they told me it wasn't a thing. I took copies of all his paperwork too, because while I was getting ready to move, I found most of what I knew about my parents separating was a lie. There was never a 50-50 custody agreement, and my mother never ran off with me in violation to that. My dad had been held for several DV incidents when I was a child. 
and he was only to see me on special holidays and only under strict supervision. He's never been violent to me, but in the papers he had hidden was evidence of a trust available to me when I'm 21. Some of the specific wording is it can go to me as an individual or to my carer if that is required. I think my dad was trying to make himself up as my carer without me knowing. I did not find a letter I read when I was a kid from dad's lawyer, but like all you said, that was probably fake. After I moved out, my dad did try to contact the police. They came to my co-worker's address because they had to, but also let me know that yes, my dad was trying to say I couldn't look after myself. His words were that I was borderline retarded and being mistreated. I've been back to Canada to visit my aunts and uncle, and found the aunt who was named to manage my trust died very soon after my mother. We're still working out the details with a Canadian lawyer about some confusion over who handles what and how now, but I have the full support of my remaining aunt and uncle, who are the same great people I remember. They were really worried about me when I went to live with dad and had tried to contact me so many times. Thanks all for your help. Your comments gave me the confidence to act. This is my shocked face when I found out the dad lied about the custody agreement and was actually an abusive POS. Blank. Same, lol. Before even getting to the end of the post, I was like, nah, Opie's mom escaped abuse from this guy and now he's trying to control Opie. It's ridiculous how similar these people are. I guess the courts didn't see this custody info when they returned her to her dad that was set up to protect her. That was unfortunate. Custody is pretty irrelevant once one parent is dead. Unless there was a restraining order or such, they'd automatically return her to the surviving parent. Especially as there seems to be no history of child abuse, just spousal. That's one of the reasons why I'm paranoid about my own safety. If anything happens to me, I'm afraid of what would happen to my kid. My parents think they'd be able to get her, but I worry that's not how it would play out. Make an end-of-life plan. Have a lawyer help you legally transfer custody to your parents, should you pass before they do. Only a court can say where children will live, so get a court involved while you are able to express your wishes. There is a 0% chance that the dad didn't know about the trust. Absolutely. He wanted Opie till 22, so he could drain the trust. Then, he would have hot potato Opie. Ah, the four years after 18 might be what he needed to prove he was a carer or whatever. It sounds like he was already working the carer angle. He just needed time until 21. Then, enough time to drain the fund. It's good Opie got out when they did. Conservatorship is very hard to overturn once it's established. He could have done some pretty awful stuff. Last story. How to spread your inheritance in a really unique and fair way while ticking off most of the family. This story is the story of a good friend of mine's grandfather and how he dealt with his inheritance in a very unique way. He had two sons, and each of them also had two sons. In the last half year of his life, my friend and me visited him every morning and every evening. You see, he did not want to go into a retirement home, and apart from getting ready in the morning and in the evening, he did not really need help. Now, I need to explain something really quick. Back in the day, we still have mandatory service in the army for 12 months, but there were several ways around it, though I will only explain the most common way since it is connected to our story. You see, instead of going to the army, you could say you refuse to go to the army for ethical reasons, which was really just a formality. You simply wrote a one-page essay why you think you being in the army would violate your personal ethics, and they pretty much had to accept it. But that meant you had to go into civil service. Civil service could be any kind of job that in a wider sense is a service to society. So these jobs ranged from kindergarten to retirement homes and anything in between, like hospitals, homes for the physically or mentally disabled, meals on wheels, pretty much anything you can imagine. You would be paid for that time the same amount of money you would get in the army and had a right to certain perks like a free room, health insurance, work clothes, etc. The same stuff any soldier gets. Plus, since soldiers get free food, you either got free food or a food allowance. I did my time in a retirement home and it was an awesome experience. I think a job like that really widens your horizon as a young arrogant kid and really matures you and shows you what is actually important in life. So back to the story. I was just done with my time in the retirement home 
and for one year Imply wanted a job around and make some money. Then one of my best friends comes to me and tells me he needs my help. His grandpa can no longer do everything by himself, but really only needs help in the morning to get ready and in the evening. And since I have learned how to do this from real professionals, he asks me to show him. So his grandpa does not yet have to go into a retirement home. He later admitted grandpa said he would rather end himself than get into a nursing home, and he seemed really serious about it. He did not tell me at the time, since he did not want to pressure me into help like that, which I really appreciated. He was one of my best friends, and I really liked his grandpa. When I was younger, I did not have a grandpa, but we visited him all the time and I became his unofficial fifth grandson, so of course I said yes. The original plan was to show him for two to three weeks, and then observe him for another two to three weeks, then he would do it on his own. But we ended up doing it together for over half a year. Then grandpa had a stroke and died within two days in the hospital. Two days later, my friend asked me to come with him to the lawyer where the last will would be read. His grandfather had specifically asked that his will should be read a day before he gets buried, which is quite unusual, but not illegal as such. I asked why he wanted me there, and he told me the lawyer had officially invited me, since grandpa had left me something as a thank you for my service. I was a bit embarrassed, but also happy that grandpa had thought so highly of my service that he even put me in his last will. Now, my friend's dad is an entitled a-hole, and the same goes for his uncle. We arrived there and went into the room. My friend is F, you get three guesses who me is. Entitled dad is ED and entitled uncle is EU. Entitled dad to me, why the hell are you here? I know dad called you and just his fifth grandkid, but this is for real family. Entitled uncle, I bet the gold digger hoped he would get some money in the will. Me, I was asked to be here by the lawyer. Take it up with him. I have no idea why I'm here. Entitled dad, if you pulled something to get to his money, I will sue you so hard. Even your kids will still need lawyers. Friend, show some respect and stop shouting. I know you two did not really care about your dad, but show at least a minimum of respect. Entitled uncle, how dare you talk like that to your elders, you little turd? Friend, you too get exactly as much respect from me as you showed your own father. None. He really shouted the last word, and it finally shut the two up. We sat down and still had to wait for the other two grandkids to arrive. The two sat right behind us, and what they talked about really made my blood boil. Apparently, they had both gotten new cars, new jewelry for the wives, and had planned a huge holiday. All that was paid for by credit, and they had planned to pay for it with the inheritance. None of them said even a word about missing him or being sad that he died. Nothing. Only me, 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 and money, money, money. They seemed to be in competition who could spend the inheritance faster the way they planned away the money. Then finally we were all there, and the lawyer read out a short letter from Grandpa. What I'll tell you here is a much shortened version, but the real thing was several pages. But it boils down to this. In recent years, I more and more realized that some people in my family cared a lot more about me than others. I am especially disappointed in my two sons, but I wanted to be really fair and not biased. So, I came up with a point system. Letter slash phone call. One point plus one extra if it is very long. Visit. Two points per hour plus one point per hour of travel to me and back. Helping me out with something, three points per hour. And this is the final result over the last three years of my life. Entitled dad, eight points. Entitled uncle, 10 points. Entitled uncle's kid one, 150 points. Entitled uncle's kid two, 133 points. Friend's brother, 288 points. Friend, 7,341. Me, 5,883. My lawyer has already liquidated most of my assets except the house. Once it is sold, the money will be divided by the points. So we know what each point is worth. And then every person gets a share of the money according to his points. For about a minute, you could hear a pin drop. Then both Entitled Dad and Entitled Uncle started shouting at the same time. That they knew we would have pulled something and this will would never stand. Of course, they tried to sue, entitled uncle, his kids, and entitled dad together. But they lost. And there was a secret clause in the will that if someone sues against the will, he loses his share of the inheritance. It took nearly three years until all the lawsuits were over. And I was blown away when we finally get the money. 
I am not naming a sum, but it was way more than I felt comfortable accepting. So I wanted to give at least some of it to the other three grandkids. But my friend finally convinced me to accept it, saying, you cared for him when he needed you, without expecting anything for it, which makes you ten times more his family than any of those losers. They got what they deserved. Now for the comments. Props to this grandpa and to you, you are a really caring person. Thanks, man. Well, in many ways, he really was my grandpa. I still remember fondly how he read stories for us as kids, or taught us fishing and how he had self-made cookies in a special jar for us. We only got one per visit, and damn were they good. So when my friend asked me for help, it was never a question of if I would do it. It was the least I could do to help him avoid his biggest nightmare, the nursing home. It was not that much work, like one and a half hours each day on average, but we stayed for much longer usually to keep him company. I really loved the old geezer, and he had so many interesting stories to tell of times I only know from history books, like going shopping with a suitcase full of money in the 20s during the hyperinflation in Germany. I had a few stories of my grandpa too. He died when I was eight, but I remember my dad telling me this one story about him. So, my grandpa served on a submarine repair boat in World War II, never saw action, but apparently he was the only one with the guts to climb up the flagpole to hoist the flag on his ship every day while the boat was rocking with the waves. He also apparently served pineapple every day on his ship, and according to my dad and grandma, he never ate a pineapple again in his life. Oh yeah, he had a ton of war stories as well. In a way, he was lucky, since he was never on the Eastern Front, but he did see his fair share of action till he became a POW after D-Day. At the time, he had a small post about 10 kilometers from the Normandy beach, and the Allied forces really surprised the Germans with how quick they conquered the beaches and quite a bit inland. Great story, man. Extremely sorry for your loss, even if he isn't family by blood. Sometimes you chose your own relatives, and he was the grandpa I never had. I imagine the final scene from Gran Torino, where Clint Eastwood left his car to the kid from his neighbor, who was a better kid than his own grandchildren. Good on you, Opie.